Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook download and 30-day free trial at www.audibletrial.com slash howshemoms. Over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. Wendy Sanders and I have a lot in common. For one thing, we have the same view because we live next door to each other. Our four-year-olds are practically brothers, constantly bouncing from one house to the other. We both love to read and talk about big ideas. But we have our differences, too. I'm a morning lark, and Wendy keeps company with the night owl that she often sees perched up on my roof. Here's Wendy. I'm definitely a night person. I've always been that way. Just, I enjoy when my kids go to bed and I have a few hours to myself or my husband and I have a few hours to ourselves to just do what we want. So that's when I do reading and surfing the internet and cleaning my house and making lunches and all of that is in the evening, probably after nine o'clock. Wendy uses her nocturnal streak of productivity to prepare for the next day so she can make her morning routine as simple and quick as possible. Then she wakes up a half an hour before her kids have to go to school and helps them get ready and get out the door. Wendy works full time from home so her husband takes the kids to school, and she gets started on her workday. For me, the thought of making lunches at night sounds terrible, because my quarter has definitely run out by then. I try to make my nightly routine as simple and quick as possible. I wake up early enough that I'll have plenty of time to get anything done in the morning. Wendy and I obviously take totally different approaches to our morning routines, but neither routine is better than the other. It doesn't always feel like this, though. Thanks in large part to Benjamin Franklin and all his talk about early to bed and early to rise, we often associate health, wealth, wisdom, and all sorts of other virtues with rising early. But it turns out, Benjamin was wrong. This is the How She Moms podcast, where we talk about how different moms solve the same problems. I'm Whitney Archibald, a mother of five kids myself. I collect ideas so you can pick and choose what works for you and your family. In this episode, we're going to talk about many different ways to approach mornings, from moms in all sorts of different situations. Moms with little kids, moms with teenagers, moms who homeschool and moms who send their kids to school, moms with different work situations, moms who love mornings, and moms who hate them. Before we go any further, let's talk more about this weird tension between larks and owls. When I asked the How She Moms Facebook group about their morning routines, I hesitated about whether I was going to share mine, because for some reason it felt like bragging. I wake up at five most mornings, unless I had a particularly late or wakeful night. On the other hand, my friend Molly was embarrassed to admit that her six kids, who range from 14 to 3, basically get themselves ready for school. They help each other get breakfast and they get dressed and ready for school. Then she wakes up right before her kids leave for school to say goodbye. If you ask me, that's something to brag about. What independent, self-sufficient children she's raised. Really, the idea of assigning virtue to a specific sleeping pattern is quite strange. Kendra Adachi talks about this in episode 58 of her podcast, The Lazy Genius, one of the best-named podcasts ever. And the content is just as good. If you haven't listened to her podcast yet, you should definitely add it to your list. On her episode about morning routines, which is full of great ideas, she talks about how for some reason we feel embarrassed about sleeping in, But we also feel embarrassed or apologetic when we're really good at getting things done in the morning because we don't want to appear like an overachiever. She says, Regularly living out a life-giving morning routine doesn't make you better or worse than someone who hits the snooze button five times. There's no arbitrary value in these choices. In fact, we have less control over our hours of productivity than we think. We all have our own regular circadian rhythm, the cycle that determines when we are most alert and productive, when we get tired, and when we wake up. Matthew Walker, a neuroscientist and sleep researcher, explains in his book Why We Sleep that about 40% of the population are morning types, 30% are evening types, and the remaining 30% of people are somewhere in between. These genetically determined preferences are called chronotypes. Walker says, Sadly, society treats night owls rather unfairly on two counts. First is the label of being lazy. Others, usually morning larks, will chastise night owls on the erroneous assumption that such preferences are a choice and, if they were not so slovenly, they could easily wake up early. They are bound to a delayed schedule by unavoidable DNA hardwiring. It is not their conscious fault, but rather their genetic fate. Second is the ingrained, unlevel playing field of society's work scheduling, which is strongly biased toward early start times that punish owls and favor larks. Although the situation is improving, standard employment schedules force owls into an unnatural sleep-wake rhythm. 
Consequently, job performance of owls as a whole is far less optimal in the mornings, and they are further prevented from expressing their true performance potential in the late afternoon and evening as standard work hours end prior to its arrival. Add to this social pressure all the books and articles written about the productive early morning habits of successful people, including two books I'll be talking about later in this episode, and it's no wonder owls sometimes feel like second-class citizens. However, I also found many articles about the virtue of natural night owls, from creativity to sociability to intelligence and even baseball skills. Their ranks include such successful people as Warren Buffett and Mark Zuckerberg. I'll link to one of my favorite articles on the topic from Fast Company magazine. There's even an advocacy group called Society B that's on a mission to break free from the 9-to-5 society and embrace different work hours for the evening types. Ultimately, it's a good thing we all have unique chronotypes. At any given time, someone is being productive. All the chronotype research is so interesting, we could spend a whole episode talking about it. But it's time to start talking about the morning routines of actual moms. And honestly, in some stages of motherhood, especially with babies and young children, chronotype is irrelevant. Our sleep cycle is more like a yo-yo than any type of bird. And most young children are naturally larks, which can prove difficult for owlish moms and dads. And then we often have our spouse's chronotype to deal with, plus work and school schedules. So many forces outside of our control. Let's start by talking about the night before. A morning schedule is directly affected by your nightly routine and vice versa. So especially if you're a night owl, anything you can do to get ready for the next day will really help your morning go more smoothly. My favorite way to think about this comes from episode 64 of the 3 and 30 podcast, Making Over Your Mornings with Crystal Payne. Here's Crystal in an excerpt from that episode. So one of the biggest things that I think you need to do is you need to recognize, number one, that your morning begins the night before. And so how do you practically apply that? It's really by developing the habit of serving your tomorrow self. So thinking of devoting a little time each day to prepping for tomorrow. What can you do the night before to set yourself up for success the next day that would help you feel more prepared, more organized, more calm? Maybe that's something like making a list of to-dos for tomorrow so you have a plan of action or getting your breakfast or lunches ready for the morning or planning what you'll have for dinner tomorrow evening or running a quick errand to save you time tomorrow, finishing a project today that is due tomorrow instead of waiting until the last minute or going to bed 30 minutes earlier or laying your clothes out for the morning. So just thinking of what are a few things that you could do today to serve your tomorrow self. This was such a great episode. Another one that I really suggest you listen to if you're serious about improving your mornings. I'll link to this one too. Kristen Steele is a nurse and a mom and is often on call overnight. She never knows if she'll get a good night's sleep or get called in. So for her, it's especially important to get as much as possible done the night before. With such an unpredictable schedule, it's hard to create a consistent morning routine. Juliana Hall is not a morning person, so she does everything humanly possible to get ready for the morning the night before. Making lunches, prepping backpacks, and laying out clothes for the next day, including her own. Then she can sleep a little longer. She tries to get up by 6.30 to help her junior high schooler, but sometimes she doesn't get out of bed until 7 to say goodbye to her and then help the elementary kids get ready. Diana Visser, a school teacher and mom of three, not only packs lunches the night before, but preps dinner the night before as well. Most moms I talk to at least try to have their kids lay out their clothes and shoes for the next day before they go to bed. This gives enough time to start an emergency load of laundry or hunt for that one missing shoe. Stacy Robbins plans a week of clothes at a time with her kids. She bought each of them hanging organizers with five shelves to hang in their closets, and at the beginning of each week, they put an outfit on each shelf, one for each school day. That way, they know everything is clean and ready, and there's no thinking required to get dressed every morning. Hillary Hess does a similar thing to prep clothes for the week. She has fashion dates with the kids who need help on Sunday night. The name alone turns it into fun one-on-one time instead of just another chore. They check the week's weather report and the school schedule and create a lineup of outfits for the whole week. These prep tactics are a great example of how night and morning people need different strategies. The only thing I do at night to prep for the next day is to try to get to bed at a reasonable time. I'm too tired at night to make lunches or find shoes, and because I wake up early, we'll have plenty of time in the morning. Even if we have an emergency and realize that someone has no clean clothes to wear, we wake up early enough that we have time to run a load of laundry. This brings me to my next point. 
As moms, often the only time we have for ourselves and the only time we have control over our own schedules is either after our kids go to bed or before they wake up. This is our time to take care of ourselves, whether that means getting stuff done, reading, studying or writing, planning the next day, relaxing in front of the TV, spending time with our spouses, exercising, meditating, whatever we need to do to recharge. Today we're going to talk specifically about alone time in the morning, since that's what this episode is all about, but a lot of these ideas can be shifted to nighttime, whichever time best fits your chronotype. For me, rising early is not a badge of honor and productivity. It actually feels like more of an indulgence than a sacrifice, a form of self-care. I'm excited to wake up because it's my time. No one is asking me to do anything. I set the agenda for one whole hour. I always start by reading scriptures or inspirational sermons, or I know I'll never fit that into my day. Then, I often spend the time making plans for my day, week, or month, and think about big-picture ideas for my family and for how she moms. Other times, I spend the time writing or reading or catching up on any online courses I'm taking until it's time to start waking the kids. I'm very protective of this time. I try to do only things that I can't do when kids are around. So I don't shower or get ready during this time because that's easy enough to do either while my kids are getting ready or after the older ones are at school while my four-year-old entertains himself. I don't clean the house either because that's something I can do while kids are around, ideally with their help. I don't exercise during that time because I like to either exercise with my kids or bring my little guy to the kids club at the gym while I do classes. Laura Vanderkam, an author, productivity expert, podcaster, and mother of five, is firmly in the early morning camp. In fact, she wrote a whole book about it called What the Most Successful People Do Before Breakfast. In it, she says, Seizing your mornings is the equivalent of that sound financial advice to pay yourself before you pay your bills. If you wait until the end of the month to save what you have left, there will be nothing left over. Likewise, if you wait until the end of the day to do meaningful but not urgent things like exercise, pray, read, ponder how to advance your career, or grow your organization, or truly give your family your best, it probably won't happen. This is your time to focus on your biggest priorities. She divides ideal morning priorities into three categories. One, nurturing careers, strategizing and focused work, nurturing relationships, giving family and friends your best, and nurturing yourself, exercise, spiritual, and creative practices. Joyce Hansett uses her mornings to nurture her relationship with her husband. She has four boys ranging from 17 to 9. Now that her sons stay up later at night, she has found that she has less alone time with her husband at night. They decided to start waking up before their kids so they could start their day with a morning walk together. Likewise, Diana Visser spends about 15 minutes eating breakfast with her husband each morning before the kids wake up. Stephanie and her husband wake up at 4.50 and work out together for an hour. Then she showers and gets her kids up to do family scripture study at 6 a.m. Then her husband showers and reads scriptures while she makes breakfast and her kids make their lunches. They eat together at 6.50 and then they all finish getting ready for the day and leave for work and school around 7.30. I talked to several moms who swear by the book The Miracle Morning by Hal Elrod, who recommends using the acronym SAVERS to structure your morning routine. The first S stands for silence, meaning meditation or prayer. The A stands for affirmations. The V stands for visualization, picturing your upcoming day. The E stands for exercise, even if it's just five minutes. The R stands for reading, and he suggests reading a personal development book or scripture or something inspiring as you start your day. And the final S is scribing, writing in your journal. Which brings us to our sponsor, Audible. This episode's audiobook recommendation is either The Miracle Morning or another book in the series, The Miracle Morning for Parents and Families. Even if you're a night owl, I recommend this book because you could adapt the routine to your nightly alone time. I don't follow it exactly, and I don't put it all in my morning routine, but I got a lot of great ideas from this book. If you haven't already experienced Audible, now is a great time to start. Audible is offering listeners of the How She Moms podcast a free audiobook download with a free 30-day trial to give you the opportunity to check out their service. To download your free audiobook today, go to audibletrial.com slash howshemoms. Again, that's audibletrial.com slash howshemoms for your free audiobook. Now we've come to the part of the morning where the larks and night owls converge. When the kids are up, we're usually up. Although many moms I've talked to have come up with ways to postpone this time as long as possible. Rachel Beckstead uses an okay-to-wake clock that stays red until it's time to wake up, and then it turns green. Her kids know that they're not supposed to get out of their rooms or wake mom and dad up until their clock is green. 
Lisa is a big believer in kids having their own alarm clocks from middle school on. She teaches them how to use them and then expects them to wake themselves up and start getting ready. If they don't wake up to their alarm clocks, she does not go in to wake them up. She just lets them experience the natural consequences of waking up late. Sometimes that means missing breakfast. Sometimes it means being late for school or going with messy hair. My mom always used to wake us up by singing loudly through the hallways, usually Irving Berlin's Oh How I Hate to Get Up in the Morning. Oh, how I hate to get up in the morning. Oh, how I'd love to remain in bed. But the saddest thing of all is to hear the bugler call. You gotta get up, you gotta get up, you gotta get up this morning. Oh, how we hated that song some mornings. Other moms blast music from a stereo. Inger prefers a gentler, gradual approach to waking her two children. About 30 minutes before they have to wake up, she shuts the window, turns off the fans, turns on the light, and lets her kids gradually wake up. At 7 o'clock, she comes back in to make sure they're actually getting up and ready for the day. I start waking my kids up a little earlier than I really need to so I can snuggle them awake and talk to them briefly about the day ahead. This started about three years ago when I realized I dreaded snuggling my kids at bedtime because it just dragged it out and I was so tired already. I definitely wasn't going to linger and talk to them. Also, my kids aren't very nice when they're tired and neither am I. So I moved it to the morning and now it's one of my very favorite parts of the day. I start with the three kids who like to wake up early and end with my night owls. I love starting the day with one-on-one -on -one time and as a bonus, it feels really nice and cozy to get back in bed. After I wake them up, the kids shower, get dressed, make their lunches, practice piano, get their backpacks ready, and do their chores. If they finish before school, I let them play on the computer, so that's a pretty big motivator for them. During this time, to be honest, I usually do the dishes that didn't get done the night before. Could it be that I now have a valid excuse for not cleaning the kitchen before I go to bed? It's just not in my chronotype to do it. Once or twice a week, I make muffins, pancakes, eggs, or some other breakfast at this time, but only if the kitchen is clean when I wake up. That's my rule. This gives the kids at least some motivation to help with dishes at night. Choosing when your kids should get dressed depends a lot on the kids. Some kids, including a few of my own, are really grumpy until they've had some food in their bellies, so breakfast comes first. Others can handle getting dressed and ready before they eat. Callista Hart's son takes so long to get dressed that she has to make sure he does it before he leaves his room in the morning or it will never happen. And some kids need to wait until after they eat because they make such a mess. Julie Cornwell uses breakfast and subsequent free time as an incentive for her kids to get ready quickly. They know that they can't even come downstairs until they're dressed, have their beds made, their teeth and hair are brushed, and their clothes are all put away. Then they come downstairs to pack their lunches and backpacks. Only after they're completely ready do they get breakfast. Then there's lunch to think about. Some families buy school lunches and avoid this problem altogether, or they homeschool and eat lunch at home. The rest of us have to figure out when to pack lunches, who will pack them, and what to pack. Jennifer Anderson has six kids, so for her, simplicity is king. No themed bento boxes or animal-shaped snacks for her kids. Each night before they go to bed, the kids make their own lunches for the day, peanut butter and jelly or turkey sandwiches, fruit, and a healthy snack or two. The older ones take turns packing a lunch for their preschool brother, too, which he can eat at home. Once the lunches are made, they clean up the mess, put their lunches in the refrigerator, and grab them the next morning. For some moms, it's easier just to make the kids' lunches themselves. It's not as messy, for one. Some like to spice it up by having a repeating schedule for the week, at least for the main dish. For example, Monday, crackers, cheese, and pepperoni, Tuesday, turkey sandwich, Wednesday, leftovers in a thermos, Thursday, meat and cheese kebabs, Friday, peanut butter sandwich. Rachel made a four-quadrant list to help her daughter pack her own balanced lunch with ideas for each category. This way, she still has a choice of what to pack, but she has to make sure she has one thing from each quadrant, a drink, a main dish, such as a sandwich or quesadilla, a fruit or vegetable, and a snack. Jordan Page of FunCheaperFree.com keeps bins of lunch food in her pantry and refrigerator at kid height so the kids know where to find their options. She makes a week's worth of sandwiches, peanut butter and jelly, and meat and cheese, and stores them in the freezer, so even the sandwiches are ready to grab and go, and then they thaw by lunchtime. She also sneaks love notes into their lunch boxes every now and then. I would totally be a hot lunch mom, but my kids are all gluten-free, so for years, I made my kids lunches in the morning when they got ready. It was always a frantic scramble, and I never knew if they would actually eat what I packed them. Last year, I finally realized that I should be making them do it. Now, I basically follow Jordan Page's system. Even if your morning routine is fairly simple, it can be helpful to post a list or chart of what your kids need to do in the morning so they have a clear process to follow. 
For little ones who can't read, picture charts work great. You can make your own or find a ready-made printable online. For her school-age kids, Audra simply writes checklists. They know to look for their checklist on the kitchen table when they wake up and they get it done. Theron loosely enlisted the help of her children to create a morning chart. They had a meeting to discuss what they needed to do each morning, and then she asked her then 12-year-old to type up a morning routine for the rest of the kids. I'll link to her post about it from powerofmoms.com. Juliana used to have a long list of expectations for her kids before they left for school at 9 o'clock. She wanted them to get their chores done and piano practiced, get ready for school, and clean up after breakfast. But every day, her three school-age kids would leave the house in chaos. They'd all be frustrated as they walked to school, and she'd come home with her two other kids, look at the breakfast dishes still on the table, and think, everyone gets to go out and have fun, and I'm the one left to clean up the house. Tomorrow, everyone better get their act together. And then they'd do it all again the next day. One particularly frustrating day, she called her mom after she got home and told her what she'd been dealing with. Instead of commiserating with Juliana about how rotten her children were being and how sad it was that she had to pick up the slack, she asked her, Why are you telling yourself that story? You like being a mom. Juliana says, It was true. I choose to stay home with my kids. I really love it and don't want anything else right now. So why was I letting myself feel this way? I decided I needed to rewrite my story. She realized that not everything had to get done before school. She relaxed about morning chores they could finish after school and decided to focus on more meaningful things like a family prayer, hugs and kisses before the kids leave the house, and a good breakfast. And she dropped the expectation of having the kids clean up after breakfast altogether. It wasn't happening anyway. Instead, she decided to just plan on coming home and clean the kitchen after school drop-off instead of being resentful of the mess. She changed that story to... It's nice to be able to clean the kitchen when it's so calm and quiet. Sometimes the craziest part of a morning is the departure, getting the kids out the door to school. Several moms suggested setting an alarm for 10 minutes before the kids need to leave the house to give them fair warning. For a while last year, I set my phone to play the holiday flight song from Home Alone instead of a regular alarm, the one that goes, I dare you not to move more quickly when that song comes on. Plus, it's much funnier than me screaming, Get in the car! Another strategy I've used to get the kids to the car on time is to let them play on the iPad once they're all ready and in the car. This gives them an incentive to get into the car and draws the others into the car as well to watch. Then they're all ready and in the car when it's time to leave. If your kids don't walk or ride a bus, the last obstacle to getting to school on time is piling into the car. Kids, read my kids, have been known to come to blows over where they sit in the car. To avoid the fighting, Molly Liggett assigns seats by month. She has two rows of three seats each and six children, three boys and three girls. So one month, the girls get the middle seat, and the next month, the boys get it. My car has two coveted seats, so the even-numbered children get to sit there on the even calendar days, and the odd ones sit there on odd days. The youngest is stuck in his same old car seat. My friend Lori Brescia used to pick up my kindergartner for school every day, and he'd come home singing all the songs they blasted in their car on the way to school. Such a great alternative to the lectures I usually gave on our way to school. We now do the same, either rocking out or listening to a fun podcast on the way to school. The kids take turns being DJ. Emerald Austin is another mom who uses that time in the car as a bonding experience with her kids. We usually get in the car and that's when we say the Lord's Prayer. And then after we say the Lord's Prayer, then each person says what they're grateful for and what their purpose is. And sometimes I'm like, I'm grateful I have gas in my car, (laughs) you know, (laughs) and my purpose is today is to get more organized with my bills or, you know, so I'll say that. And then again, the first time, like the first couple of weeks that you say it, it'll be very superficial. And sometimes it will be superficial. Sometimes it won't be. Um, But you'll start to see the change in the children. For example, one of my daughters, she is kind of like, she likes to be the center of attention in class. She likes to be the mom. So she's always, I mean, she, since the day she's been in school, she's <laughs> always got in trouble for talking. So once we started doing that, then she, you know, would say, oh, my purpose for today is to be good. You know, she would say things like that. But then her focus started being, you know what, my, my purpose for today is to get an A on my science test, is to get an A on my math test. And then we will follow it up. So then what are you going to do today that's going to help you get a day on your test on Friday? And like I said, now she's (laughs) she's thriving. There's no, there hasn't been any talking. 
hopefully we get into that this year to where we keep going with that positivity, but it's just really focusing them on goal setting. So there is no right or wrong. I don't correct them about anything. I let them think freely and openly about what they're thankful for and what their purpose is. Many mothers solve the chaos of getting their kids out the door to school by avoiding it altogether. That's one of the main reasons Cheryl and Lindsay started to homeschool. When her kids went to public school, she found that their mornings were frantic and she'd spend most of the morning yelling at her kids to get ready. Then she'd drop them off at school and say, I love you. She wondered which of those two messages was actually getting through to her kids. Now her morning routine looks much different. She wakes up at 5 o'clock to go running and then gets ready for the day and wakes her kids up at 6.30 to start getting their chores done. They take care of the dogs, cats, and chickens, clean their own bedrooms, and help with other household chores like dishes and vacuuming. They also practice piano and voice during this time. Then they start school at 9 o'clock. In a more extreme escape from the rat race, Josie Laducci and her family did boat school on their sailboat as they sailed from California to New Zealand over several years. She and her husband woke up before the kids and had coffee together. Then they took turns, with one getting the kids up and fed while the other one exercised. I'll link to articles from HowSheMom.com with more details about the daily routines of Josie, Cheryl, and Emerald, and Juliana. Whether you're on a boat or on land, mornings can be an opportunity to find some alone time, to build relationships, and to actually enjoy your family. And at the very least, they can be a little less crazy if you focus on finding solutions to some of your persistent problem spots. Good luck and good morning. Thank you for listening to the How She Moms podcast. If you like it, tell a friend. The bigger the community, the more ideas. There are lots of ways you can add your ideas to the How She Moms community. We have a new Facebook group where we share ideas about upcoming topics and help each other solve problems we're facing in motherhood. You can also follow How She Moms on Instagram for quick tips and ideas. And you can go to HowSheMoms.com where you'll find transcripts of episodes and lots of other great resources. Special thanks to my mom, Susan Singley, for recording my theme music. She played this song all the time when I was growing up, and to me, it's the soundtrack of motherhood.